So Sister Diana speaks to us now, then till now behold his face. Sister Diana Ortiz. Hello everyone, this is not my usual position, so forgive me. This morning, Sister and I watched the sun rise as, it, as dawn came, and we discovered a beautiful rainbow, didn't we? We stood out there and we looked at this complete rainbow and all the colours that arrived with the light. And for me, every time I see a rainbow, to me that is God's promise dawning. And that was the sense I got this morning. And the fact that colour only exists in light, in the darkness we can't see colour. And I thought of what you told us this morning. So the whole thing has been a journey for me from the time that I started reading Sister's book. And in sharing the fact that I was going to be coming and looking after Sister this time I was here, our family piano teacher, not a Catholic, hearing the story and being a woman of note in the South Island, that's the main island, mainland, <laughs> Um, wanted to contribute, wanted to give you something from New Zealand. So in a minute, they'll probably put on the screen for us a picture of Doug who grew the wool, who owns the sheep. Can we see Doug? This farmer up here is Doug, and he lives in Kaikoura, and he's 80, and he owns the sheep. Okay. Next, we have Rosanna and Maeve. Rosanna is the young woman who helped dye the wool for this garment. Next one. Maeve spun the wool for this garment for sister. Full of rainbow colours, you'll note. Here's Maeve. Maeve was originally Canadian. She's come to New Zealand and she loves not only us but the land. And she spends a lot of time in the bush and a lot of the time with birds and a lot of time with nature. So she loves our land and she takes from our land and she gives and she wants you to have this. And she said, please take this up for all of you. I give you this sister, not just from Maeve, not just from Doug or Rosanna. This is from all of us for you. We're a mixed up bunch of colours, I think, but each of us are beautiful on our own and woven together, let us bring her love forever. God bless, thank you. Thank you, it's very warm. <laughs> Any presentation that I, or reflection that I share with others, I make sure that I light a candle, and Len was very kind to light the candle again for us today as a reminder that survivors of torture are in our midst, as well as those who are being tortured today. Philip was saying that he had not been to Medjugorje. I haven't either. <laughs> but someday. I spoke earlier of my death experience in a clandestine prison cell. And at the time, God's absence was like the loss of a friend who had betrayed you. I had but one hope left, and that was that I would die. And through the years, I have learned that this hope, this prayer to die is universal among those who have survived torture. As a torturer from Honduras once said, eventually 
they all begged to die. And I certainly did. This morning, I said that I escaped from my captors, but that's not quite correct. There was no escape. Although I was no longer in that clandestine prison, my torturers were still with me. I could hear them, I could smell them, and I could feel their presence. They came out of that clandestine prison with me, laughing at me, torturing me still. This morning, I also shared with you that the policemen had said to me, your God is dead. As far as I was concerned, the God I had pledged my life to had abandoned me. The God who had spoken to me through scripture was nowhere to be found. Although I was not Jesus, of course, still God had become Judas to me. And upon returning to the United States, a friend became aware that my Bible had disappeared, ironically perhaps into the hands of my torturers. And so she presented me with a new one. Get it away from me. Those were the words that I wanted to shout. I wanted to pitch it into the nearest trash bin and wash any traces of it from my hands. Instead, for reasons I did not understand, I kept it, but I wrapped it in a dark handkerchief, just as I had been blindfolded, so too was the Bible. In that way, it went with me from place to place, the mother house in Kentucky, to my family's home in New Mexico, and finally to a treatment center in Chicago. I was planning to bring the Bible with me, but the last time I carried a Bible with me and I was pulled aside for a security check and my Bible was taken from me, so I have not allowed this Bible to um, travel with me after that experience. In an obituary written about the actor Dirk Bogard, there is a powerful observation. As one of the first British soldiers to liberate one of the concentration camps, he saw what had been done to the prisoners. And for him, that was the death of God. There could be no God if human beings could do that to one another. And in my prison cell, I met evil face to face. I saw what human beings were capable of doing to one another. And with that realization, my own faith in humanity was shattered. I shared Dirk Bogard's horror at what people could do to one another. But his final solution, the death of God, was not to be that easy for me, for God refused to die. At the treatment center, I began to talk about what I was feeling and especially my anger towards God and all humanity. I had many questions 
I wanted to ask God, but unfortunately, we were not on speaking terms at that moment, and so I turned to the Bible. I took the Bible from its nesting place, and I removed its blindfold, that dark handkerchief that I had used to wrap it. And although my hands trembled, I touched it, full of fear, and I dared to open it. Incredibly, I read, I read words of hope. And during one of my therapy sessions, I opened my soul and shared with my therapist what I had done with the Bible, first blindfolding it and then freeing it. He was Catholic and I fully expected him to disapprove of what I had done. He listened and I began to understand that part of my healing process involved reacquainting myself with God. My therapist went so far as to suggest that sometimes God speaks to us in the most unusual of ways. He shared that sometimes he himself would let the Bible fall open randomly. And sure enough, there was a message for, from God waiting for him. I was comforted because until then, I thought I was crazy. But I soon found myself replicating his ways, letting the Bible fall open to whatever page it would. And for an entire week, I'm not exaggerating, for an entire week, it kept opening to the miracle of the loaves. And for an entire week, I was profoundly annoyed. <laughs> I was trying to find some way to survive my torture, and day after day, I ended up with that same passage. How was I to go on living when my life had been destroyed? Was I supposed to be guided by miracles? If there was one thing I most definitely did not believe in, it was miracles. So once again, I closed the Bible, not really surprised that the dead God had nothing to say to me. I was willing to leave it at that, but others would not. They tried their best to convince me that God was alive, that I was a beneficiary, a recipient of God's miracles. My escape, apparently, was one of those so-called miracles. But no one had answers to my questions. If God were so interested in me, then why the burnings, the gang rapes, all the other horrors? Had I not been forced to participate in the torture of another human being? God's mercy, God's miracles, where were they then? And what about all the others in the prison, the ones whose screams I heard? Where were God's miracles for them? And where was God after my torture? 
Why couldn't God at least erase the memories that haunted me? Why couldn't those screams and cries be drowned out? The tortured carry our torture with us all our lives. Jean Amory, the tortured Austrian philosopher, said, Anyone who has been tortured remains tortured. Anyone who has suffered torture never again will be at ease in the world. Faith in humanity, already cracked by the first slap in the face and then demolished by torture, is never acquired again. Amory was right. Some 20 years after his torture, he took his life. There were times there are times when I have thought of joining him. In that world where he now rests, there is no anguish, no despair. And like many who have survived torture, I yearn to rest, to be free of memories to be free of fear. But torture's ghost walks with us every single day of our lives, reminding us that the past is not gone, that the past will always be. And without a moment's warning, sights, smells, and sounds that many take for granted can trigger a memory for us. Something as normal as the smell of a cigarette, the smell of body perspiration, seeing someone in uniform, hearing someone whistle, a simple act of making eye contact, going through airport security, all can take us back to our torture. No miracles, no God in need of time. The Bible, covered with the dark handkerchief again, this time, once and for all, or so I thought. Years later, when I was a little bit stronger and in a far different setting, I read once again about the miracle of the loaves. And there it was. Why hadn't I seen it before? God had been trying to speak to me, to speak to me of healing, healing through community. When I had first read the parable and dismissed it, I was living in the house in Chicago with torture survivors. Many of them nearly died under torture. Some had been left for dead. Some had been tortured so badly they could not walk or speak. Family members had been disappeared. There was so much pain, so much brokenness. I remember in particular Julio Chalcu Ben from Guatemala. 
He was picked up by the military, and for two weeks, he was subjected to horrendous torture. He was given no food and only urine to drink. Thinking that he was finally dead, the military dumped his body on the roadside, and he was found by firemen who took him to the morgue. The person on call at that time, for some unknown reason, took his stethoscope and placed it on Julio's chest, and he heard a heartbeat. Immediately, Julio was taken to a hospital where he remained there for nearly five months. The doctors didn't think that he would survive, but he did. Julio's throat had been slashed with a machete, and he had received severe beatings to the head, which left him brain damaged paralyzed and unable to speak. So five months after he had been found, he was able to write out his name and the name of his village, enabling his family to discover for the first time since his disappearance that he was still alive. Julio had come to the United States to receive medical and psychological treatment. He learned how to say his name. Whenever he met someone new, he would point to himself and say, Soy Julio. Mi Julio. And then he would display the scars on his body and say, Tortura. Guatemala. He wanted others to know that his name was Julio and that he came from Guatemala and that he had suffered torture. I felt completely helpless and hopeless. I could do nothing to heal him. Nothing to heal the other survivors with whom I lived. All I felt was anger, a little smile here and there, or a touch or a hug. What good was that? Their lives had been broken forever. At this time, I had no understanding of the power for good that exists in the idea of community. In the parable of the loaves and fish, Jesus asks Philip how they can feed all those people. Philip was a realist, as was I. He could do the math. There was no way the crowd could be fed. Not enough food, not enough money to buy more. Philip was a realist, so was I. And as I surveyed the wreck of my own life, nothing, no one was capable of putting it back together. What I had at one time was now gone, lost forever. And so it was with my fellow survivors. Julio would never be the same. He would never be able to carry on a normal conversation. We were all lost. I had done the math. 
But what I had to learn, what I finally began to learn years later, was that there may well be something more than the math. There is the unexpected. Graham Greene says, life is absurd, therefore there is always hope. Life is absurd, therefore there is always hope. Jesus accepted what there was, five loaves of bread and two fishes offered by a boy. He didn't complain or dis despair. He gave thanks to God for them, however insufficient they seemed, and he started passing them out. Take what you have in an attitude of faithfulness, in an attitude of faith, and it will be enough. It will be more than enough. That was what God had been trying to tell me, but I didn't know how to listen. As time passed, I forgave God for not working some dramatic miracle undoing my past. I learned that God was indeed working a quiet, unobtrusive miracle healing me through other people. Those small gestures, smiles, hugs, and kind words, all we had to offer each other in that house in Chicago had begun to counteract the power of the torture, smirks, and punches. True, I still had my horrible past. It will always be a part of me. But laid over it, however, as a gentle balm, is a more recent past of healing and caring. God and I both dead at one time, began to be on speaking terms again. It was not easy, and it was not quick, but it did begin to happen. And I'm so grateful that God was patient with me. That promise I had made to my fellow tortured to God assumed the greatest of importance. If I survive, I will tell the world what I have heard here. I will tell the world what I have seen. I will never forget you. That promise has led me into a direct disagreement with the realist, the Phillips of the world. They assure us that the world will never be tortured free. But we who are survivors of torture will not stop. We are determined that someday the world will be torture free. We may not live to see that day, but we are determined to be miracle workers ourselves. 
I'd like to share with you one of these miracles. For a number of years, I directed all my energy to Guatemala. I thought only of the Guatemalan people. You see, I could not imagine, I could not accept that the horror I had witnessed and survived was occurring in countries all around the globe. And like many people, I attempted to blind myself from this reality. Then this miracle began to happen. I was meeting others who were not very different from me. They too had survived their torture, but they came from Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. The blindfold that I had unconsciously worn fell, and from them I learned that torture was a worldwide epidemic of terror. And so out of this task, the Torture, Abolition, and Survivors Support Coalition International was born. We came from countries around the world. We were women, men, and yes, children. Different colors, different religions, different cul cultures, and different political ideologies. But we shared two things in common. We were united by one terrible fact and one powerful commitment. We each had been tortured. And we were committed to making certain that what happened to us would not happen to you, your children, or your children's children. Torture does not end with the release from some clandestine prison. Torture leaves no part of our lives untouched. For many survivors, survival is far worse than the actual torture itself. Through our Communities of Healing and Helping Hands programs, TASC is able to reach out to the survivor community. Each of us has been wounded. We recognize that we cannot alter our past, but we can try to shape our future. And in doing so, some of our sisters and brothers have chosen to rebuild their lives by building trust in themselves and in others but choose not to be a public voice in the struggle against torture. But for us, their very survival is a testament to the human will, a strong yes to life. And then there are those of us who, as a result of our torture, have become advocates against this crime which is currently being practiced by more than 150 governments. And one way we do this is by speaking truth to those in power. We confront the architects of torture, those who order it, justify it, and practice it. When survivors of torture challenge governments and world and church leaders, we do not do it easily. Oftentimes, we are criticized. We're accused of being troublemakers. 
sometimes were accused of being terrorists. Some of us have even received death threats. But we knock on the doors and consciences of our world and church leaders because we regard it as our moral obligation. To regain one's faith does not mean that it will never be tested again. In my own case, when I think of what is happening in today's world, I find myself losing faith, and I wonder if there is any hope for humanity. In those moments, God again seems so distant, and I'm left in utter despair. Strangely, I can hear my torturers snickering, gloating that they were successful in once again destroying my faith. But then, somehow, it is then, or it is during those very moments that I realize that my faith is, in fact, unshakable. There are times when I may lose contact with it, but even in those dark moments, I know that it's still there. And it is then that I know again that my tortures have not defeated me, that I have not succumbed to the evil that was done to me, nor will I. It is in the face of deepest despair, I believe, that one's faith is strengthened. And what is the nature of my faith? I believe that by our works, we live our faith. For faith is action. Our faith calls us demands of us that we live out the gospel. And that gospel insists that like Jesus, we speak truth to power and stand on the side of the poor and oppressed. So when I'm asked about my faith, I speak of the form that faith takes in action. I speak in terms of what I do my faith is found in my ministry with other survivors in working to create a world free of torture. I will never have the words sufficient to describe the horror of what was done to me in that clandestine prison. But paradoxical as it may seem, I truly believe it made me a better person. For some reason, I survived. In a way, I would like to credit my tenacious spirit, which came from my dad and my mom. But 
deep within me, I believe that God may have had something planned for me. Although, why me? I will never know. As a result of my torture, my eyes were opened to a very different world from the one I thought existed. My faith, shaken, threatened, has survived. It is not as it once was. I believe that today it's now rooted in my work. It is not passive, but active. Each day I try to live my faith and I hope that sometime soon I will return to my first love, teaching children. Until then, guided by that faith, I will continue to work for a world free of torture. Just a very few days ago, Jesus hung on Good Friday's cross as he does on that day each year. But that is not quite correct. Jesus hangs on that cross every day, every hour, every minute. He is hanging there now. Every day in my ministry, I look into the face of the tortured Jesus, black, brown, and white, male and female, every age, regardless of religious or political belief. The pain, the sorrow, the betrayal, the face of Jesus in the tortured world. The miracle of my life is that out of unspeakable horror came a new mission in life. And I no longer have any doubt who set me on it. I believe that God has a plan for us. And I pray that God's plan for you is as clear as God's plan has come to me. And I pray that your plan, God's plan for you, will rest on this credo. Thou shall not be a victim, thou shall not be a perpetrator, and above all, Thou shalt not be a bystander. Thank you.